Will you pray with me? Holy, gracious God, we ask your spirit now upon this time and space. Give us your wisdom and guidance and help us hear your word. We seek it this day. Amen. Paul was very lost, at least by his own somewhat later definition. He had murdered the saints of the church. He had stood in the way of the way of Jesus. He hadn't seen Jesus as the Messiah or, frankly, as anyone special at all. And it proved in the book of Acts of the stoning of Stephen. Then, then he had gotten permission to take the persecution of those belonging to the way out of town, to pursue them where they had fled to. A blasphemer, a persecutor, a man of violence, so it says in 1 Timothy. Paul was the foremost of all sinners. He was on the wrong path. He had strayed but unintentionally from the ways of God. He was lost. And then something amazing happened. In Acts, we know it as the road to Damascus transformation. Elsewhere in the Bible, Paul describes it as a mystical experience where he sees the risen Christ and leaves the details very much out, and quite intentionally so. First Timothy merely says that he received mercy, that grace overflowed within him, that he became, a, at that time, an example of what God's mercy and forgiveness might look like, what it might look to be lost, and then to be found. This makes Paul rather useful this morning for us because our texts talk about lost and found, so the themes of lostness, what it means to be found. First Timothy, a text that may or may not have been written by Paul, and scholars are in fierce debate about that, nevertheless helps us to reflect upon his story, but his life. In the Gospel, brings us the first two of three consecutive parables about those that were lost, the third one being the story of the prodigal son, who read back in Lent. Parables about lostness, what it takes to become found. And of course, the ideas of lost and found are prominent in our Christian thought and theology and music and art. So it's good to take a moment on this sermon, the scripture is leading us to it, to think about what it means to be lost and found. To think about Paul's story, how it might help us reflect on these things. So what do we learn from Paul? Well, to begin with, it's worth noting that Paul, who would later describe himself as lost or a sinner, would not have been thought like that by those around him. No one else, when he was Saul the Pharisee, would have thought that he was lost or a sinner or anything like that. He was a faithful member of the community. He was always present at worship. He seemed rather pious. He did all the priests asked of him and was careful to follow the law, which was the only way to follow God, to the letter. There's no reason to believe that in a different letter when he writes these words, he was being boastful. As he writes, he was circumcised on the eighth day, a Pharisee of Pharisees, and to the law, blameless. He was, in every conceivable way, the perfect follower of Yahweh, the perfect Jew. And yet, and yet Paul would write, write later about that time in a way that we would say describes him being lost, describing it all as rubbish and worthless compared to Christ Jesus. Now I have to be very clear. I am not saying that Paul's life till that point was worthless. I am certainly not saying that any other religious tradition is bad or rubbish. I'm not sure even Paul is saying that, although he is saying that after his conversion, all the rest of his life paled in comparison to a found in Christ. And I want to parse the idea very carefully, the idea of being lost for Paul, but very carefully. 
But it's important for us to hear, hear a lot about a parsonage. Because many of us, perhaps even all of us, have moments where we feel just as lost as Paul did. We might look like we have it all together. It might appear as if everything is as it should be. We might even be going to church every single week. Have every appearance as a Christian woman or man who knows how to walk the walk and still be lost. For one, we all stand in need of the grace and mercy of God. We all mess up. We all make mistakes. We all have blind spots that, however we strive to overcome them, remain present and challenging in our lives. We all have moments where we have acted in ways that separate us from each other and from God to stand in need of the reconciliation that Christ offers us. It's a part of what it means to be human, and it's simply unavoidable. Even more like Paul, Many of us, all of us, have moments when we feel especially lost, where all that we do seems to be either disconnected from those around us or from how we can discern God's will. We feel disconnected from our own God. Moments where our dark nights of the soul seem to constrain us and overwhelm us. Where like Paul, we feel at our worst. We're like Paul feel very lost. And in those times, like Paul, God comes to us and says, you are now found, you are loved, you are beloved, you are mine, you are enough. In those times, God says to us, we never were lost in the first place. And even more so, again, like Paul, God comes to us even in those times and says, right now, you're being called for the sake of the kingdom of God. And those two claims together are really the good news here. It's good news that Paul, even Paul, one of the most important saints of the church, could at different points in his life have been lost. Because we have been there too are there too. It's good news. Paul felt lost because God said to Paul, you're not your found. It's even more good news that Paul, during that period of lostness, was claimed by his Creator, was seen as worthy of God's love and grace and worthy of God's call in his life because that helps us to see our own worth in our own darkest moments. It helps us to see our own use to an invitation from God. God calls Paul and plans to use him even before he is found. The version of 1 Timothy constricts the story a little bit, but we know from other places that Paul's call came before he knew Jesus Christ. That indeed his conversion came almost as a direct result of his call. The light on the Damascus Road, the mystical journey to heaven, these things helped Paul to see whom Jesus truly was, but that also served as his call to be an apostle to the Gentiles, to help shape the early church and therefore the modern church in ways beyond our imagination. God called Paul even before Paul felt found, even before Paul became a Christian and a follower of Jesus. God called Paul even when he was still a sinner. And the thing is this, if God did this with Paul, God will do so with us as well. I remind you that we all stand in need of the grace and mercy of God Friends, even as we stand in that need, we are called by God nonetheless. We are given tasks for the sake of the kingdom of God just as we are. Our journey of discipleship does not require us to be perfect or sinless or to have it all together. It really requires us to be willing. And when those moments seem especially dark, when we're at our absolute lowest, 
sometimes God may be using those moments to prepare us for a special task, just like God did Paul. An important caveat here, I don't believe God causes those moments of depression and darkness, our worst moments. But God can use them in ways that go beyond our imagination. We may at times feel very much like the human beings we are, sinful, full of faults, struggling to walk in God's ways. But God not only loves us and declares us enough, God sees the ways our frail human efforts can be world-changing and kingdom-building and then calls us into them, just as we are. If you don't believe me, then I will point you to the story of John and Newton. Some of you might know this story already, and I do apologize for repeating it, but it's a good one. Newton was an 18th century Englishman who had served the Royal Navy before becoming a part of the Atlantic slave trade. He was not a man who was religious from his upbringing, but he eventually became, so we'll get back to that in a second. In a storm off of Ireland, he cried out to God because the ship seemed to be sinking and he was fearing for his life. When the ship was saved, Newton began to work out his faith for himself. He thought that he himself was a wretch, and he pondered that he even deserved mercy and forgiveness, even deserved God's grace. And from these ponderings, he changed his life. He gave up cursing. That's it. That's all he changed in his big conversion moment. He once swore like a sailor, literally, and now he didn't. He was still a person in the Atlantic slave trade, still a person who couldn't let go of the evil of that. But God was at work within him, and God kept at work within him. Newton was still very much lost, but he was being called by God for something greater, and God kept at him in that call. And Newton, who once profited from the Atlantic slave trade, had become an abolitionist advocating for the end of slavery and living to see it end, actually, at least in his home country of England. Newton would leave the life of sailing and become an Anglican minister and a rather accomplished poet. But he would write poems about his life, testimonies to how he had been changed by God, praises to the one who had led him through many dangers and toils and snares including one really famous poem, became to him Amazing Grace. Like Paul, he had been truly lost. Like Paul, he had been called by God in ways that would affect the world that would build up the kingdom. We may or may not be called to think as great as these. I have no idea which of you is the next great hymn writer. But we are called nonetheless called because God can use us as we are. No matter how lost we feel, God declares us found and calls us into God's service for the sake of the world. We may have huge dark nights of the soul, or we might merely feel disconnected at times with God from each other. And all these times matter what? can trust that God is with us, that God's love still shines through us, that God still loves us as we are. Trust that the God who declares things found has found us, that we are no longer lost. Trust that all of us lost, even us, may one day be found. Trust in the amazing grace of our God. Now and all the time. Thanks be to God. Amen. Y'all know what song's next, don't you?